uh, county, city, and from other parts. I want you to know how much we appreciate your presence on today. I want to thank in particular the Green Meadows Congregation, the eldership, and Brother Thompson, the minister, for allowing me to be a part of this gospel meeting. I'm grateful to the membership here for accepting me on this occasion and challenging me uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. For that, I am honored and I'm great, greatly indebted uh, to this congregation. I want to thank all the gospel preachers that I hear uh, who have come to support and encourage the work here at the Green Meadows Congregation. In particular, I want to thank my family that I'm very proud of for uh, being here and uh, in support of uh, myself and my wife uh, as we come to share uh, the word of God as well. I I'm just greatly appreciative to God uh, for my family. I don't get a chance often to say that, but you know, God has a way of making you proud and it's not about what you have in your pocket, but what you have in your person. God have, I believe, blessed me uh, with two wonderful sons and four grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, two beautiful daughters, amen, and a host of nieces and nephews. Uh, that I love like my own children. And so I, I'm just elated right now, uh, just standing here uh, and seeing them uh, supporting uh, me and my wife. And I'm greatly appreciative to my wife because of what she have allowed me to become uh, in the gospel that is a servant of God and a minister of Jesus Christ. Without her help, I would not be able to achieve what I have achieved in the ministry. I'm greatly indebted to see uh, Brother Roy Street and Diane here with us from Louisville, but I'm extremely grateful to see two of my members, Brother Sam Streeter Sr. and Sam Streeter Jr. are here from Louisville Newburgh Congregation. I'm going to ask them to stand. Roy, you can stand if you want to, but I want them to stand. All right. Glad to have you here with us, and I appreciate you coming. I know you didn't come down here for me, but you came anyway. I didn't ask you to stand, Roy. <laughs> I just kidding. I just kidding. I appreciate Brother Roy and Diane. I, I know I can count on their support all the time, but I'm grateful to the sister congregation uh, for being here to support this great work. I'm not going to keep you long this afternoon, but I want to say enough to help us uh, to be what God will have us to be. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, <clears throat> I want you to turn with me to the book of Mark chapter number five. I know on the screen I have verses one through six. Uh, but to get the fullness of this text, I, I need to read some verses, and I read them fast. In verse 1, then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the gatherings. And when he had come out of the boat immediately, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chain, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus afar from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, what is your name? 
And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirit went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine, uh, those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. And when then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Connecting the disconnected. Connecting the disconnected. The world in which the sovereign Savior came was fragmented and disconnected. Man has fallen from his native environment and was thus enslaved by his egotism, dehumanized by his dis disobedience, demeaned by his demeanor, divested of self-worth, and demonized in life. This was true in the social, political, and spiritual arena of life as well. So Jesus encountered a people deprived of the privilege of personhood. He dwelt among a people minus the freedom of wholeness. Wherever he went, he was pursued and pressed by fragmented pieces of clay. Now the question that I want to present here, did you not know that the wealthiest spot on the planet it is not in the oil field of Kuwait. It is not in Nigeria, Iraq, or Saudi Arabia. Neither is the gold and diamond mine of Africa. Uh, uh, is, is it in the gold and diamond mine of South Africa or the uranium mines of the Soviet Union or the silver mine of Africa? Though it may surprise you today, the richest spot on our planet may be just a few blocks from your house. They rest in your local cemetery or graveyard, buried beneath the soil within the walls of those sacred grounds. There are dreams that never came to pass, songs that was never sung, books that was never written, paintings that never filled a canvas, ideals that were never shared, vision that never became reality, inventions that were never designed, and plans that never were fulfilled. In our graveyards, our, our graveyards are filled with potential that always remained potential. When I come home, even to Nashville, my heart frequently, frequently weeps as I encounter and observe the wasted, broken, and disoriented lives of those who years before were talented, intelligent, aspiring high school classmates. During their youth, they had dreams, desires, plans, and aspirations. Today, they are lost in a maze of substance abuse, alcoholism, purposelessness, and poorly chosen friends. Just a few weeks ago, I read in the Courage Journal paper of Louisville and had an article about disconnected youth and young adults in our community. This study, y'all stay with me now, this study was conducted by the Brooklyn-based group called Measure America. They found approximately 21,700 Louisville youth ages 16 to 24, they, are, they were disconnected. This study suggests one in seven between the ages of 16 and 24 are neither working nor in school. Are you still with me? The report found that 5.5 million Americans fit that same description in our community making them far more likely to be on public assistance, incarcerated, in poor health, or even dead. 
this man that we find in our text today was very much like any brother or sister that we may encounter in life. But something happened in his life that brought separation of his body, soul, and mind. Maybe he was married and lost his family. He could have been abused as a child or he had become the product of his environment. Whatever his trauma was, life has become too much for him to deal with. He let his pants fall well below his waist and his self-respect has fallen beyond his ability to feel good about himself. But thank God that Jesus showed up by crossing over to the other side. You see, in this text, Jesus had just left a storm that was external in Mark chapter 4 to deal with a human storm that was internal. Are you see a Whitman? And what I see in this text is that I see the fiber of our society. I see our, the fiber of our society is dis disconnected in our uh, uh, community. I, I see that the fibers of our society is disconnected in at least four ways. We are disconnected morally, socially, emotionally, and spiritually. So when I look at this text here, I don't just look at legion, but I have to look at myself. I have to look at our community. I have to see how disconnected people really are without Jesus Christ in their life. And when I look at the first point, when I see folk that are disconnected morally, and all you have to do to see that we are disconnected morally is listen to the ruling of our Supreme Court, the highest court of our land that are trying to override the laws of the Supreme Court in heaven. How they came down with a law disregarding what God said and decided that it's okay for a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman. But you have to stop and connect things together. The Bible says in Genesis 1 and verse number 26 and 27, it said God said, and that's the, the, the most important thing, is that God said, let us make man in our own image. According to our likeness, let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, let, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Watch verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. You see, God knew what he was creating. God created male and female and God joined male and female. Am I right about it? In the marriage ceremony, God saw that this was the proper way for any law of any land, any country to regard was his own laws that he gave from heaven. Not only that, but we find in Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 27, it says, therefore, God gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Worship and serve the creator, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, listen to me. God gave them up to vow passion for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature likewise also the men leaving the natural did y'all hear what i said leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust for one another men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error that was due this is what we are confronted with in our society if every time the church need to be involved in connecting the disconnected, it is right now. 
You, you see, folk are disconnected. Now, it may not affect your congregation, and it may not affect mine, but I guarantee you it is affecting somebody's congregation. How do you know, preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked the question, because just before I came, uh, we got a guy that named Stumble. Roy know him well. Uh, he come up with a, uh, some type of legislation he wanted to fashion, and what he says in the legislation was that he was going to uh, uh, prepare this les- uh, legislation to allow preachers in Louisville to perform gay marriages and issue a license that the county clerk would not issue. Now, I got some news for Stumbo. Amen. Now, he can send somebody uh, to Louisville. He can send somebody to Newburgh. But I tell you one preacher that will not perform any homosexual wedding. Now, I don't know about you down here. Now, I know the sentiment is the well. Uh, we got them in our family. Yeah, I got them in mine. You got them in yours. But let me tell you something. That will never override the Supreme Court in heaven. Now, I love him. I would do anything to help them, but one thing that we cannot do is transgress the word of God. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody, but, but I'm going to help you even further than that, and I may not get back for real this time, but let me tell you something. You're going to have, you're going to have some preachers right here in our area, members of the body of Christ, who's going to perform, who's going to marry some homosexual couple. How do you know that, preacher? Well, let me tell you why I know that. Anytime preachers try to preach Christ and would not preach the church, try to preach Christ, would not preach baptism, try to preach Christ and not the five acts of worship, it's a preacher that would marry homosexuals. <laughs> let me tell you something, and I go on record. You can tattoo it in the way you want to. It is not the word of God. It seemed like that wickedness now reign. It looks as if morals have moved. Righteousness has resigned. Love has been assassinated. And hope is locked up. But thank God. God is still on the throne. And God is the only one that can connect disconnected people secondly what I see in the text not only was he disconnected morally but he was disconnected socially you see in this text it's a profound pitiful picture of a devil controlled life he has been bound with shackles and chain but he had broke, broken those chains and the bible says that no man could tame him. They called the authorities to deal with him, but they could not stop him nor help him. The social service program could not do it. The rehab centers couldn't help him. The criminal justice system with the first time intervention program could not help him. This man's problem was of a Dominic, a Dominic source. And I stopped by to tell us that when you got a bunch of demons all up in your head, you'll quickly learn you cannot solve supernatural issues with natural approaches. It just don't work. And it won't happen. When you look at this man socially, you will recognize him the moment you saw him. His hair was matted together. His face was unshaven, blood running from self-inflicted wounds. He was foaming at the mouth. The clanging of change could be heard as he drags them. He doesn't wear any clothes or live in a house, but he has his dwelling among the tomb. The stench of his dry pus and sour vomit was unbearable. He would come at you screaming, and crying like a wild man. When you look at the text again, Mark here is not reporting 
only on the man external, but he talked about his internal situation. In verse 3, the man is unsettled. Look where he lived. He's comfortable around dead folk. In verse 4, he's uncontrollable. He could not be a, a, a change or calm or reason with. In verse 5, he's unhappy. He depressed in despair, decadent and demoralized. In verse number 6, he's unstable. He does not jump up and down rejoicing but fall at the sight of Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, that is why there are so many of our families in our communities that are tore up from the flow up because the head of the family, the man of the house is out there in the graveyard of society. You want to know why we have social problems? It's because the man himself is not where and what he ought to be in the sight of God. Go on and preach it, Brother Fleming. You, you see, I've learned, church, in a world of hate, somebody got to love. In a world of despair, somebody have to have hope. In a world of darkness, somebody got to see light. In a world, uh, uh, rather, got to see light. Because life will leave behind a parade of powerless, lifeless, aimless people and relationship. When we look at our society, look at our social society, we see the lowdown, the outcast, the throwaways, the unclean, the socially and religiously, religiously deprived. But church... They must be disciple and connected. As long as Lucifer is loose, as long as Bezalel is busy, as long as Satan is slandering, as long as the lion is roaring, as long as the devil is deceiving, and as long as the prince of darkness is prating and plotting, there will be trials in this life. None of us will escape the provision of perplexing problems. All of us will, will pass by the intersection of nowhere to run and no place to hide. You see, all of us, we are involved, whether you want to be or not. And as a church, we are obligated in our ministry to connect disconnected folk. But let me give you something else. You got some disconnected folk in your membership. That need to be connected. Hello. And let me tell you something else. About me. Now. I don't care. About the color. Of a man's skin. What party. Tea party. Republican party. Democratic party. If he goes against. The word and law of God. I will not vote for it. Did you hear what I'm saying? Uh, Y'all looking funny. But I'm going to tell you anyhow. Now, I, I, Obama done a lot of great things. But when he voiced and he led the charge on this homosexuality and, and the right to marry and equality for everybody, it messed up everything and it will mess up the church. Y'all don't see it yet. But let me tell you something. The homosexuality is just a back door just to get in the church and mess up some old stuff. Why are we focusing on homosexuality? And that's not the only sin confronting America. We are focusing on that. And don't you know Satan is busy coming up with something else. That's why the Equality Act is a bad act. Marriage had never been for equality. Oh, Y'all look quiet. But you come on back this week. And I have some stuff for you. But you got to understand where we are and what we should stand for. Isn't that right? This man, he had a social problem. Nobody seemed to care for him. They talked about him because he had all of these demons. But nobody tried to help him. I'm glad that Jesus decided to go over to the other side. Because on the other side, 
of Galilee while some disconnected people. Thirdly, people are disconnected emotionally. The Bible said in Luke 8, verse 26 through 28, then they sailed to the country of the gatherings, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. He wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tomb. In 827, he is unclothed. His body was out of control because his head was out of control. Let me tell you something. You can expect or require anybody to be in control or under control when their head is out of control. And nobody can deal with the head or the mind but Jesus Christ. The only one can bring some sanity to this man's life. Many have been beaten down by Satan, used and abused by sin, overcome by their circumstances, traumatized by their trials, frustrated with their problems, and mesmerized about their future. But as the winds blow and the waves move without restriction, it leaves behind a path of destruction. It leaves drowned dreams, flooded faith, uprooted hope, crushed foundation, hurt feelings, sleepless nights, broken home, and unforgiveness of sin. When adverse wind blows, even in our personal home, it will cause waves of problems and disrupt our habitation when the winds blows in the church it will blow and leave jealousy covetousness prejudice pride selfishness greed that will blow on the church family i stop by to tell us today that until we figure this thing out you hear what i'm saying until we recognize what the church's role is in our society we will continue to be confronted with a disconnected society. And until Christ is shared and deposited in the hearts of men, we will have a disconnected world and disconnected people. You can expect, expect folk to be connected to what you are teaching and preaching if they are disconnected mentally and emotionally from Jesus Christ. Don't you know folk put most of their problem on Christ or the Godhead? People blame God for their situation and for their circumstances. People would not look at other folk, but they will blame God because they believe God don't care for them, don't love them. And it caused a person to lose all his emotional stability. And he began to perform as he see fit in his life. But thank God, Jesus connects disconnected people. I'm closing now. Number four, our society is disconnected spiritually although this man's eyes are open and he's animated he's in fact unconscious and under the control of a devil named legion don't just look at him some of us got some legion got some devils in us this word legion at least means four thousand and can go up to high as 12,000. At the minimum, this man had 4,000 demons in him. Now, how could he respond intelligent as a human being when all of these demons is all wrapped up in his head? In Mark 5, verse 6 and 8, 
it says that when Jesus was still some distant away, this man saw him and he ran to meet Jesus and fell down before him. Now, I know the scripture said that he went to worship him, but that's not accurate. You see, casting down yourself or portraying or prostrating yourself is a form of obedience or worship. Now, he didn't go to Jesus to worship Jesus. You have to understand this because you're going to miss the whole text. It was not the man that went, but it was the demons in the man. They went to Jesus. And when they went, they cried out or gave a terrible scream. Why are you tormenting or bothering me or us? Jesus, they speak, the demons are speaking now. They said, Jesus, son of the most high God. For God's sake, I'm using the New Living Translation. For God's sake, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit. Come out of the man, you evil spirit. So here is the spirit that's doing the talking. The demons that recognize Jesus. Do you remember Paul over there with Cephas? You remember when his sons tried to cast out demons? And the demons said, you know, uh, 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 Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? You see, sometimes the, the demons don't know us, but they know Jesus. You hear what I'm saying? And when they saw him, they thought he was coming to torment them. But what Jesus was coming to do was to liberate this man from all of the demons, the heartache, the pain, the discomfort, all of the trials and suffering that he had endured. I'm glad that God Allow Christ to be our connecting power. When they requested of Jesus to come out of the man, it said there was a herd of swine over by the mountain. And they requested, let us, don't send us out of the country, but put us in the hogs, the pigs. And Jesus gave them permission, and they went into the pigs and went down a steep cliff and was drowned in the sea. Isn't that right? I'm talking about spiritually now. And the Bible said, so all those who fed the swine left or fled. And they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who has been demon possessed, who had the legions sitting clothed and in his right mind. And the Bible said they were afraid. Now, this man had terrorized these people for a long time. And now Jesus liberates him, connects him back to reality. Am I right about it? Put him in his right mind. Put some clothes on his back. Am I right about it? And the most important thing is he's not running around, but he's sitting down at the feet of Jesus. It shows us that this man had more sense than the folk who ran and went back to the city. And the Bible said that that when they left, they went and told everybody what had happened. And they wanted Jesus to leave the country. But this man whom the demons were excommunicated from his body. He said to Jesus, 
He said, let me paraphrase. Let me travel with you. He didn't want to go back. You know why? He came to reality. Them folk were way crazier than he was. <clears throat> you see, he wasn't in control of what was happening to him. But these folk was in control of what's happening to them. But Jesus said, now nah, I want you to go back. Go back to the city. Go back to your family and friend and tell them what the Lord have done for you. You see, this man went back. Jesus got back on the boat and went back again to the other side of the sea. This man went and publicized everything Jesus had done for him. And this time, Jesus came back across. And guess what? Everybody was waiting to see Jesus. What's the point, preacher? It shows us that one person who has been disconnected can cause disconnected people to be disconnected. Let me tell you something. I'm through now. Now, we, we represent God. Am I right about it? We represent everything the church is supposed to be and everything the church is to stand for. If we're going to connect disconnected people, we cannot act and live like we are disconnected. Y'all looking funny. I'm, I, I'm, I'm preaching to somebody. Whether they amen me or not, I got a whole sack of them somewhere. That's the church's dilemma. That's the problem. We live like we are disconnected. And can you imagine somebody that is disconnected trying to connect the disconnected? Now, y'all ain't getting it. Let me use another one. Now, I ain't got my cell phone. <laughs> but if my cell phone were disconnected, Ralph, and your cell phone were disconnected, I would be a fool trying to get, tell you to connect your phone and my phone is disconnected. I cannot help you to connect your phone if my phone is disconnected. What I would tell Ralph Hill, you need to get down to the cell phone place. Do you hear what I said? In order to get your phone uh, connected, I would tell a soul, you need to get Jesus to get connected. I can tell you what he said. But Jesus only and only Jesus can transform the heart and change the mind, change the spirit, and put or be a character in one's life that he will become and be everything God want him to be. Connecting the disconnected. Church, we need a voice. Amen. Stop letting everybody put, uh, uh, put everything down your throat. Telling you just because you're black, you got to vote for a Democrat. And he messing up the laws of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying when I look at all the good he's doing. Well, it's good. May be good, but it's bad. It's even worse. Do you hear what I'm saying? Oh, now y'all hear what I'm saying. Now, 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 he may give you a stimulus package to put something in your pocket, but he's not giving you anything to put in your person. And anytime you sacrifice for your pocket rather than your person, you got a problem. And you know what? A lot of them will listen if the church speak up and speak out. A lot of them really don't want to vote for the laws. They do. 
But nobody put any pressure on them to tell them. Our society is disconnected enough. Don't need any laws. Don't need anything else to cause more disconnection among our society. But the church has a key role. I'm stopping. We have a mission and a purpose. And that's connecting the disconnected. Y'all looking funny. But if you go home, I challenge you just to look in your family and see how many disconnected folk you have in your family. That you want to see to die and go to hell. You just, look, I challenge you to do it. And see if you won't try to do everything you can to connect them to God. That's all I'm saying. We have to be a connecting people. And God has to connect people through us, through teaching and preaching the word of God. Don't ever give up on God's word. And let me tell you something else. I'm, I'm so enough stopping. I'm not worried about nothing. Because when God get tired, God going to stop all this foolishness. <clears throat> Do you hear what I'm saying? Uh, no, they may be winning the battle, but they ain't going to win the war. God is going to stop it. And God has his own way. I don't know how. Don't know when and don't know where. But one thing I know, that when God get tired of it, it's going to stop. It's going to stop. If you're here today, maybe you may be among the disconnected. It is my prayer, my desire, is that we become a connected people. Connected to one another. Connected to the church. And connected to God. We have to be connected. We the only source. Only light. That God have. In this world. And we got to shine. We can't hide no more. Amen. You see. All of the gays. They came out of the closet. The church is going in the closet. <laughs> that, that's what's happening. They came out. And we are going in. But church, we have to reverse that role and be and become what God will have us to be. If you hear and you subject to the gospel, why don't you come this evening? Maybe you need a change in your heart. God can change minds. He can regulate heart. God can do it all. And I know some of us, somebody here is sympathetic toward everything I've just said. Somebody may say, well, we're, we're preaching, you know, uh, uh, it, it, just leave him alone. God ain't going to leave him alone. <clears throat> I'm not going out starting a fight with them. But if he ever come my way, they got one. I'm telling you right now, if you're afraid to preach it, get out of the pulpit. Because it's going to challenge the church. Somebody, can I, can I have a minute? Somebody is going to come into your congregation and they're going to require or ask you to perform a marriage that is gay. And they're going to get some of us to do it. They're going to say, I give you a thousand dollars if you perform it. It's going to be a whole lot of brothers. <laughs> going to look past where you know, maybe I can. You know. Oh, yeah. They're going to find a way. But we have to stay with God. Pay the price. If you can't preach it or you won't preach it, then don't be in the poor pit. Because I'm going to preach it. I done told the church in Newburgh, instead of building a building fund, you better get some bail money set aside. <laughs> That's right. And come and bail me out. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Because if you want me to stay with the Lord, you want me to preach the gospel, you, you better get some bail money. Because I'm going to preach what the Lord said. Now, that doesn't mean we hate them. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But you can't agree with their lifestyle or their practice. And not just for that sin, but for any sin. If you're here and you're subject to the invitation, we invite you to come. If you're not a member, come. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sin, rose from the dead the third day, went back to heaven, sent forth his spirit, and the apostle preached the gospel of Christ on the day of Pentecost. Believe it on your heart. Be willing to repent of your sin. Confess your faith in Christ to be God's son. Go down with him in the waters of baptism for the remission of sin. You'll come up a new creation of God. A member of the body of Christ, you will have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Your name will be enrolled in heaven. If you're faithful until the end, he said, I give you a crown of life that faded not away. If you're, here, you're a member of the church and maybe you've been straddling the fence, you didn't know whether to go or to stay. You need to make up your mind. If you're going to be on the Lord's side, you ought to declare it. You ought to say whatever come and whatever go, I'm going to be with the Lord. Make up your heart's mind. And if you're subject, we ask you to come to as we stand and as we sing. <clears throat> Somebody is knocking at your door.